Welcome back to the Dr. Cliff Show. This is part two of a three-part series on hearing aid best practices and how they can make or break your hearing aid treatment. Coming up. All right, we are back live for our 13th episode of The Dr. Cliff Show. I'm Dr. Cliff Olson, audiologist and founder of Applied Hearing Solutions in Phoenix, Arizona, and I am here with my co-host. Hello, everybody. You might notice I sound a little bit different today. I got a little bit of hoarseness to my voice, but I'm still here to do the show anyway. So we use the term best practices a lot on this show because they are so important in high quality hearing treatment. And last week we did an episode on best practices and audiological assessment and hearing aid selection. And if you haven't seen that episode, definitely make sure you go back and watch that after today's show to kind of lay some of that context down. Um, but at this point in the best practice journey, if we'll call it that, um, the hearing aids have been ordered and now we're going to dis discuss some of the factors about hearing aid quality control measures and also the hearing aid fitting. So get into the fun stuff today for sure. Um, for our Hearing Up Provider Spotlight, we will meet with Dr. Sarah Curtis, and after that, we will get into hearing aid verification measures. So um, if you haven't already, make sure you like and subscribe so that you receive notifications when we release part three of this series. Awesome, but before we jump into everything, we do have to uh, talk about our first sponsor here. Now guys, our sponsors are the reason why this show can even carry on. So um, this first sponsor that we're gonna be getting into, I wanna make sure that we lay some context here. So over-the-counter hearing aids are official at this point. Uh, as of October 17th, 2022, you can officially buy legitimate over-the-counter hearing aids, which is something that we have not had before. We've had a bunch of over-the-counter type products, but none of them actually met the requirements that the FDA uh, set into place. And uh, these are intended for individuals with perceived mild to moderate hearing loss. You do not need a hearing loss prescription from a hearing care professional to get these devices, but not all of these devices are created the same. And that is why you should check out the Santro over-the-counter hearing aid. The Santro was developed by Soundwave Hearing out of Oak Brook, Illinois. The Santro is a receiver in canal design and they use their Autotune app for testing and making programming adjustments to your devices. You can see them on the screen right there. Um, this particular app through the testing, I was able to identify an asymmetry that I do have with my hearing and it did give me a prompt that, you needed, that I needed to go see a hearing care professional. So of all of the different products that are starting to hit the market, you wanna make sure that you buy from a reputable company and a company that is not just trying to sell you a device, that they're actually trying to help you uh, treat your hearing loss as effectively as humanly possible. Now, I did do a review of these particular products on my channel. You should definitely check out that review. And if you want some more information on the Soundwave Santro hearing, that's S-O-N-T-R-O, then you can go to hearsoundwave.com. Excellent. Okay, jumping straight in, we are moving into quality control for this first segment. And so we see quality control in various different industries, right? Quality control is really just confirming that the device, the automobile, whatever it may be, is performing to the specifications that were set forward by the manufacturer, right? So um, can you tell our listeners a little bit about when and why we would run these kind of quality control measures? Yeah, so um, inside of an audiology clinic, when we order new devices for a patient and those devices come in, we cannot just assume that those devices are functioning the right way. So we can't technically take a patient through a hearing aid fitting with a pair of devices that we have not run through quality control. And the way that we would do quality control inside of an audiology clinic is to put them through a test box. Now, to just kind of give an idea um, of how this actually works is that we actually take devices and put them into this box and we run a calibrated sound through that. And a little bit later, we're going to show you graphics of that. Um, but it's important to not only have them new from the manufacturer, but when they come back repaired from the manufacturer. So if you have a hearing aid that's not functioning the right way, we have this happen multiple times a week because we have a lot of patients mm -hmm. and we have to uh, test these devices to see, okay, they are falling out of manufacturer specifications. We're going to send them back to the manufacturer, get them repaired and get them back into the clinic so we can refit our patients with them. And then what we find sometimes is that those devices are still not 
meeting manufacturer specifications. Right. So that's a problem. So anytime that you have a new hearing aid come into the clinic, anytime that you have a repaired hearing aid come back into the clinic, we need to run them through this particular test. And there are a variety of different things that we would actually measure with these devices. And you know, you, uh, you're measuring basically the distortion, the static inside of the hearing aids, uh, any reports of weakness that a patient has. We can run them through the test box and identify what variable is breaking down inside of those particular hearing aids. And we also like to be really proactive with this as well, yeah. not just reactive. So we don't have to wait and rely on a patient reporting to us that there's actual problems going on with their hearing aids. We can kind of jump the gun, and we typically do this annually. If we haven't run a hearing aid over the course of a full year inside of this diagnostic test box, then we need to make sure that we're actually doing that. And oftentimes we will uncover things that the patient didn't even realize it was going yeah. on, we get it fixed and they come back, they put them back in their ears like, oh my gosh, like, like this is so much better completely than what experience. I had before, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. It's definitely not completed enough, I will tell you that much. Uh, it takes, you know, a good amount of time to run the hearing aids through this test, especially if you're doing it as when they come in from the manufacturer, when they come in from repair, annually, right? But it's so important because there's actually some data out there and we just decided today that we're gonna start tracking this number by number in our clinic as well to give you even more kind of precise data estimates on this, but there are reports from some clinics that between 25 and 30 percent of the hearing aids that are received from the manufacturer, uh, new or returning from repair, are not passing initial um, electroacoustic analysis testing. And that is huge because if you're going to go fit a hearing aid on someone and it's not meeting those manufacturer specifications, they can they can ask a million questions how does it sound does this sound right does this sound right does this sound right it's never going to sound right because it's out of specs and we're, we're a little insulated from this because we have an audiology assistant right. inside of our clinic alexis she's fantastic she runs every single hearing aid it seems like that's all she does yeah, in the back seriously is running hearing aids through the test box but um she's running them through and we actually asked her when we were prepping for this show um what percentage of devices do you think have to go back to the manufacturer because we got them and they were still not meeting specifications and i'm thinking that she was going to give us the number that was very similar to what i've heard before um from other data that's out there that's between 12 and 18 percent mm -hmm. and she said eh, about a third of them yeah. and I'm like a third of them yeah that's so many that is ridiculous you're telling me that if we did not run the test box measures on these devices that one out of every three patients would be walking around with a hearing aid that is legitimately malfunctioning yep. inside of their ears and we'd have no clue yep and they probably wouldn't even have a clue they just figure oh this is as good as it gets and okay right, right. so that's why you have to do the quality control otherwise you can never ensure quality with that. Absolutely. Now, before we get into the data sheets and mm -hmm. show you guys what we're actually looking at, let's let's show you an image of the hitbox. Uh, so we use a very particular hitbox in our clinic. That is exactly what it looks like right there. And you can see that there's a speaker right there in the center of the screen that is actually playing a calibrated sound to the hearing aid that is kind of mounted on that pedestal with that putty. And then we have a reference micro microphone, which is being held by the fingers there on the screen, right over the, the front microphone. So we can actually know what the sound is going into the hearing aid. And then we basically measure the output of the hearing aid to measure a variety of different things. And let's go ahead and pull up the data sheet here for what we get from a hearing aid manufacturer. Now, when we're looking at this, we can see there's a bunch of information on this sheet, but this is the data that we look at when a hearing aid first comes in from a manufacturer, and then we compare it up against the test box measures that we get. But let's zoom in on this here a little bit, and we can show you some of the specific measures that we're looking at. So if we start at the top, of the screen here. This is for an ultra power receiver and we are actually putting it into our coupler that's inside of the box. And so when we're looking at the top couple of numbers there, that is the output of the hearing aid. So how loud can the hearing aid amplify to? We wanna make sure that the hearing aid is getting up close to 132 decibels of max output and have a high frequency average of around 124 decibels in sound pressure level. Down towards the bottom half of the graph, we can see the, the amount of gain or acoustic gain in this case. We want to make sure that the maximum amount of gain is approaching very close to 71 decibels and that the high frequency average is at around 65 decibels. 
as we keep moving further down the graph there, we can see that we're looking at total harmonic distortion. So everybody, you know, would have some understanding of what distortion is. It's a, a unclear sound, basically. Mm -hmm. But we want to measure distortion levels that, in this case, right around one and a half or one to one and a half percent, depending on the frequency range there, um, would be appropriate for this device. And there is a little bit of leeway here. We typically tell patients if you're below four percent, you're good. Uh, we can actually measure the milliamp drainage of the batteries, but the other number that we're looking for at the very bottom there is the equivalent input noise level at 19 decibels. So we do not want the noise that the hearing aid generates to be much louder than 19 decibels in this case. So let's go ahead and walk them through what we would actually see inside of the test box. Right. So um, getting the hearing aid set up with the test box, it looks a lot like the graphic that we just showed. We put it in the test box, we connect it to the software close the box and then we have to stay pretty quiet as well because it is running some pretty specific measures there. Um, as it's running these measures, however, we end up with this test box result page, if you will. And so uh, the very first one that we have to show you is one from a hearing instrument that did pass um, these specifications. And so if you look over on the left hand side, that looks crazy, right? There's a lot of really strange names, weird numbers, percentages. Uh, uppercase letters, lowercase letters, it looks a little wild. So um, we are going to contextualize this a little bit further on the failing graphic, but we do have a graphic that outlines in red um, around the perimeter there, uh, specifically up at the top. So on that last data sheet that you were just talking about, at the top, the very first number that you talked about was that OSPL 90 max, which is that uh, pretty much the highest output that the hearing aid can produce. and on that graphic, it was 130 uh, dBSPL, uh, yep. and uh, as you can see, the output from this hearing aid was at 128.3, and I believe that's an over and under of four? Yeah, four decibels. So as long as we're within four decibels of that number of 130 or 131, we're good. Yeah. And in this particular case for the output, so how loud can the hearing aid amplify to, we are within specification range for that. Right. And if we go back to that graphic here for just a moment, we're also looking at that um, full on gain. And so again, you can see those numbers off to the right. Uh, there's a couple different ones. There's a max gain reading. There's that um, high frequency average gain reading. But overall, those numbers are lining up very consistently with what we're looking for out of this hearing aid. Um, I guess I didn't pick an image that had the uh, distortion percentages on there. However, uh, we can assume that they were within specifications for this patient. Um, and this will make a lot more sense as we're walking through these measures when the hearing aid did not pass electroacoustic analysis. Yeah, and you guys will catch this on this next graphic that we have yeah. here because we have a hearing aid that performed horribly right. inside of this. <laughs> so um, you can tell by the images on the right hand side of the screen that those curves are substantially lower on this graph than what they were otherwise. But over on the left hand side here uh, for the um, OSPL 90 max, uh, that came out to a score of 106.2. And for this particular hearing aid, we were well below what the uh, tolerance range was for the, the output of the devices. And, and typically, anytime that you see, depending on the type of receiver that someone uses inside of their ear, these numbers are generally gonna be up in the hundreds. If you start dropping below 100 for any of the output numbers, you know that there's something wrong with the hearing aid, and you almost don't even need to break out the spec sheet once yeah. you get familiar with different products and what their capabilities are. Yeah, you start to get pretty good at like tracing the curves just visually and knowing like, oh, something's kind of off with that hearing aid. Um, but we're using the actual you know numerical values as well to really discern okay is this meeting specifications or not and so the next one that we're going to look at is the full-on gain measure for that um, specific hearing aid as well we were laughing earlier about <laughs> this because the full-on gain for this hearing aid very likely was supposed to be around 60 to 70 decibels and you can see that the high frequency average at least clocked in at a whopping 9.8 <laughs> decibels of yeah. gain which it, means that <laughs> an average conversational level that hearing aid is probably operating more so as an earplug than anything. Yeah, most likely. And and that's represented by the actual, it's like a turquoise curve at the bottom of the graph there. You can see how low that is on the graph, but uh, it's kind of crazy to think about. So this is the amount of amplification that can be added to an incoming signal into a hearing aid. And for someone with a hearing loss to give them like nine decibels of amplification, uh, and you're not even getting that because that's like the, the what you would see if you had the hearing aid turned all the way up right. in volume, you'd get nine and no one would their hearing aids at full volume it will 
Some people probably do, yeah. but this individual definitely would not want to wear their hearing aids at full volume mm -hmm. there. Um, so it kind of gives you an understanding of like, you see a number like that, you do not pass go, you don't even have to run the rest of the test. You know the hearing aid is not meeting manufacturer specifications. That thing needs to go back into the manufacturer ASAP. Yeah, um, immediately. Because something major is wrong with that now, device. Now chances are, we, we always do an initial listening check of the devices as well. And so we have listening tubes. They look like uh, stethoscopes that you put in your ears with a small tube that runs down so that we can actually put the hearing aid next to the tube and listen to what it sounds like. Um, now, very generally, I have normal hearing and you have somewhat normal hearing, but we do a listening check just to see. Most of the time, we'd be able to listen to that and go, oh, something's way out of whack here. Um, but we, again, put it through test box measures just so that we can verify. It also works as a great tool to demonstrate um, to the patient, right, if we're like, uh, you know, we got to send it in for repair. Oh no, why? You know, uh, here's why. Here's exactly we can, why. We can very or easily Or this is going to be an expensive repair. And they're like, does it really need to go in for repair? It's like, yeah, look at this. It this is must horrible. go in for but repair. But there's the other situations where it's like, oh, listening check actually sounded pretty good, but the patient's reporting like, no, just something's not right. Yeah, it's just And then off. you run it through and you're like, holy cow, we have crazy distortion levels, which is the next thing that we're going to show right. you here um, on the screen. So once we get through the full-on gain measures, uh, we end up bringing it down to more of a reference test gain setting where we're putting it more like user settings. And we typically want to see uh, percentages of distortion. Like I said, below 4% and you're usually pretty good. But we can see distortion percentages on this hearing aid climbing up to uh, upwards of 11% distortion there at 1600 hertz. And that would tell you that even if the, the output numbers and the gain numbers were perfect, if you have distortion numbers like this, that the sound is not going to come through the hearing aid cleanly. And and it's going to sound like garbage. Right, right. And what's also going to make a hearing aid sound like garbage is when the equivalent input noise is also too high. And so that's the final uh, measure that we're going to show you here. As you can see, 27 dBSPL, that is a significant amount of noise. And that's literally just circuitry noise from the hearing aid operating as a hearing aid. Um, and so to some users, depending on what their hearing loss configuration looks like, they're going to be able to actually detect and hear that circuit noise as it's running. However, 27 decibels is way too loud. Uh, we'd really like to keep uh, equivalent input noise below 20 decibels or so. Yeah, and you know, the shocking thing about all this is is that there's not a lot of providers who do this. You know, mm -hmm. I know that one of the big best practices that everyone talks about is real ear measurements, and we're going to talk a little bit about real ear measurement here later in the show, so make sure that you guys stick around, but just because you do real ear measurement doesn't mean that the hearing aid is actually mechanically functioning the right way, so you have to establish that first, that the hearing aid is mechanically capable of doing the things that you're going to program it to do, and to think that there's probably... I don't know, I would say probably somewhere on the order of 10% or less. If I had to just guess yeah. based on interviews that I do with providers who come into the Hearing Up Network is that there's a select group of people who've been doing it and they do it by the book to a T every single time. One of our Hearing Up providers on the show today is exactly that yeah. way. Um, and then there's other providers who are like, yeah, we do everything else, but test box is the one thing that we haven't been doing wait, 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 and they wait. have uh, gain entry into the network. and. You know, what happens if you don't do test box measures? What, what, can, what can happen to a patient? Uh, I mean, what ends up happening is that the patient is reporting that things just aren't right or they're going back um, for adjustment after adjustment after adjustment and it's just, they're just not getting it done correctly. Um, and at that point, it's, it's not actually the fault of the person programming the hearing aid and it's, uh, it's not an issue that was created by the user either. It's just that the device is, is out of specifications. It's not operating the way that it should be operating. And so there's no way to definitively know if the hearing aid is operating the way it should be other than running electroacoustic analysis on the hearing aids. And you had a good point earlier that um, you can sometimes listen to a hearing aid. Uh, what about me? Like I have hearing loss in one of my mm -hmm. ears. I might listen to it and be like, hey, it sounds fine to me, yep. right? But there is no, you can't guarantee that a hearing aid's functioning the right way just by talking into it and listening to your own voice. It's way too subjective. Absolutely. Um, and so this is one of those verification measures that we need to be using objective 
data to determine if the hearing aid is functioning the way that it should be. Absolutely. So um, I think that we've, uh, you know, talked a lot about test box measures here, which is absolutely fantastic. This is one of those things that if you're calling up an audiology clinic and you want to, uh, you know, ask them questions to see if they're right for you, asking them if they perform test box measures and the front office staff will probably have to go and ask the audiology mm -hmm. staff to find out because it's not a commonly asked question. Uh, but that's the great thing about being an informed individual about your own hearing treatment is that you get to ask questions like those to a clinic to find out if they're right for you. Um, but we're going to be talking more about an easier way to do that here in a little bit. But before that, we have to jump into our next sponsor. Correct. So our next sponsor that we've got is Eosera. So Eosera has an entire comprehensive lineup of ear care products for ear wax, ear pain, and ear itch. Um, I actually just used this product in the clinic today had the most stubborn wax in an ear canal and it was essentially adhered to the canal wall. And unfortunately, when the earwax gets that adhered to the canal wall, the ear canal is extremely sensitive. And so trying to peel it off of the wall uh, isn't always the most pleasurable of experiences for patient or provider. Um, and so I used some of the earwax MD drops, put them in the patient's ear, came back about five minutes later, went in, that wax came out, so easily we were able to remove it in one swoop no problem um, and that is exactly why we use earwax md in the clinic because it just works and so for patients that have earwax that continually you know piles up pretty frequently um, or if you know that every single time you go into your audiologist they have to remove wax on you this could be a great product to get that wax softened up so that when you go in that experience is just a lot easier, a lot better for, for both parties. Amen to that. Yeah. So um, they have many, many, many more products. So make sure that you go to eosera.com and definitely use the promo code CLIFF20. That will get you 20% off your entire purchase of any of the products in their lineup. Awesome. Thank you, Eosera. So we're going to jump into our Hearing Up Provider Spotlight segment here in just a second. But if you guys don't know what Hearing Up is, it is a network of hearing care professionals that have been vetted and they're uh, following best practices inside of their clinics. And when I was talking about there's an easier way to find out if your hearing care professional is going to be doing things like test box measures and real ear measurement, the easiest way is to go to hearingup.com and find a provider in the network. And we have one of those network providers on the show with us here today. Uh, uh, so who do we have? Today we've got Dr. Sarah Curtis. So Dr. Curtis got her doctorate in audiology from the University of Tennessee. Uh, she is on the audiology practice standards organization as the or on the board of directors rather and she's also on the government affairs committee for the Ohio Academy of Audiology. She also has her certificate in tinnitus management by the American Board of Audiology and she's been practicing for 12 years, but just four years ago, she opened her own practice, the Sounds of Life Hearing Center. In addition to being an incredible provider, she's also a mother of three. So thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Curtis. Oh, hold on. We're not getting audio here again. Let's check this. We did check it before the show, though, so I know second. we'll get it in a moment. Yeah, so just give us a second here. And while she's trying to figure that out, I will say that I have trouble being an average provider with zero children. And yeah. She, <laughs> Seriously, though, I don't. I literally don't understand. So um, she will have to teach me her ways yeah, because absolutely. that is pretty absolutely. incredible. So um, you know, she's actually been in the Hearing Up Network now for uh, pretty much since I started it. Uh, we started this network about three years ago, um, and you know, I I knew of her already because anyone that I would talk to is like, oh well, yeah, Sarah Curtis. She she follows best practices to a T, uh, and you kind of get to know providers in social media to some degree, and you can tell like oh yeah they're doing all the things the right way in their clinic and so when I was thinking about this series there were a, a few providers that I was like these are the people that I want to definitely have on for this particular segment mm -hmm. um, and she's one of them all right so okay let's see Sarah if we've got you back now oh bummer no mm -hmm. yeah I know we had the audio why don't we do this why don't we um, come back to it again here in, yeah. in a few minutes um, let's jump into our next segment here. Okay. Um, it might just be a reboot on her end uh, to get the audio back going again, but we want to make sure that you guys ha uh, yeah, ha have her log off and sign back in. That's perfect. So um, let's jump into our next sponsor then. Uh, so here, funny story per usual. Um, 
I had a patient who uh, snowbird because we live here in Arizona. We mm -hmm. treat patients who spend half of their time up in a northern state and they come back down here and then we fix things up for them because they went horribly, horribly wrong when they were away from our clinic for too long. Mm -hmm. um, but I had a patient uh, actually call in. This was right around the first year that I was practicing and um, they were doing the dishes at their kitchen sink and they got done with their dishes. And what do you do when you're done with your dishes? You run the garbage disposal, right? Well, oh. well, it didn't sound quite right when she ran the garbage disposal. So she, you know, turned off the garbage disposal, stuck her hand down inside of it, and her right hearing aid was down in the garbage disposal. And that sucker was chewed up worse than any dog could ever chew yeah. up a hearing aid. So, uh, but that is exactly why you need ESCO. So ESCO Definitely. specializes in providing loss and damage and repair insurance coverage for your hearing aids. So you do not have to pay for expensive repairs or buy new hearing aids before you are actually ready. They have a variety of different coverage plans so you can get a quote for your exact hearing aids on their website. And then if you go to esco.com forward slash Dr. Cliff, Dr. Cliff show viewers get a $10 Visa gift card just for registering your hearing aids. So in that particular case, we did have to file a loss and damage claim because no hearing aid manufacturer is going to take a hearing aid that has been completely destroyed inside of a garbage disposal and just do a standard repair, repair. on it. Yeah. So I uh, had to pay the, the deductible. But once you use a deductible, that's it. You can't get that back. And so uh, ESCO is a great way to make sure that if you have to use that inside of your warranty uh, plan and you have to use your deductible, you can get that reinstated through ESCO. Yeah, ESCO is great great there's so many weird circumstances or weird scenarios where something like that happens um, kind of that expect the unexpected type of a thing so always better to make sure that you have the coverage there for in sure place. just wait just wait till next week when I talk about my patient who microwave their hearing aids yeah it happens people like you're thinking Cliff you're crazy you're just making stuff up now I am not making this stuff up. I know you're not because I have just as many crazy stories, but it's like, it is so crazy that right? these things happen. Oh my God. That hearing aid definitely would not pass text test box measures <laughs> after that. that is, the receiver wire was totally chewed off of it. I don't even, you couldn't even hook it up. No, no, can't even test it. Honestly. So uh, once we have determined at that point that the hearing aid is meeting manufacturer specifications, uh, we have you know, it's past all of those measures. Okay, now we move into the actual fitting of the device. And I think in the audiology world, we all know what the term fitting means, mm -hmm. but um, to patients, a lot of times they don't. And so anytime that you hear the phrase hearing aid fitting, what that really is, is an, an appointment to fit the device in your ear. Like physically fit physically it. Physically fit it to you, um, but also program the device to your specific hearing loss and, and whatever hearing loss that you have in, in either ear as well. So anytime you hear that hearing aid fitting, it is referring to the actual fitting and programming of the device. And a lot of people think of me as like, I'm just the guy who only cares about the realer measurement side of this. And I tell people like, that's not even the most important thing when it comes to a hearing aid fitting. The most important thing is the physical fit mm -hmm. of the hearing aid. Now the physical fit will have an impact on the acoustic fit that we are verifying with realer measurement. But this is an important thing to understand. This is top priority stuff here. Um, if we have a poorly fit hearing aid, and we have an example, we'll put it up on the screen here, of a receiver and canal hearing aid that is not fit properly inside of the ear canal. So obviously on the right hand side of the screen, you can see the green check mark. That is a properly placed receiver tip inside of an ear canal using a receiver and canal hearing aid. And on the left hand side with the red X on it, obviously that hearing aid is not in where it needs to go. Now, I don't care how awesome you have that hearing aid programmed. If you don't have it placed inside of your ear canal correctly, none of that matters. Right. And from a physical fit standpoint, we're really looking for two things. Number one, comfort. Okay. Because if it's not comfortable, you're not going to wear it. And so first and foremost, we've got to make sure that this device is something that you can keep in your ear for hopefully up to 90% or more of your waking hours. But from that picture that we just saw, the second thing that we're really looking at is retention or how well is that hearing aid going to stay in your ear as you go about your day. That, that uh, graphic that we saw with the X, that hearing aid is not staying in your ear. Um, if you, you know, bend over to pick something up, it's going to fall right off of your ear. Um, and we saw this with, with COVID a lot when masks were, you know, everywhere. Um, if you didn't have a very, a hearing aid with a good high level of retention, taking the mask off, we just shoo, slingshot it, you know, across 
the Absolutely. parking lot. And uh, people had to file loss and damage claims they for did. that as they well. They did. They uh, did. But this can also happen. You can have a poor custom fit as well. Yeah. So when you think of doing a custom earpiece or a custom molded hearing aid for someone's ear canal, you would think it'd go right into the proper placement. But sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't happen. But if we establish a, a fitting appointment that the hearing aid doesn't actually go in the proper placement or it's uncomfortable or something like that, we have to get that ear mold remade. Now let's show an example here of what a good fit would be on the right hand side of a custom molded uh, hearing aid. And then on the left hand side, you can see that is not in proper placement. So again, first off, that would be very uncomfortable. Uh, number two, that would fall out of the ear incredibly easily, and that person is not getting the amount of amplification that they need because the receiver tip is not properly into the ear canal at the right depth. It may have been very well verified by the hearing care professional using real measurement at this point. Um, but there's something that we don't see on this particular screen that is very important that uh, everyone needs to understand, and that is the venting of an actual hearing aid. So we have the venting of a custom ear mold. We also have the venting of a rubber dome that goes inside of your ear. All of this, not just from a retention standpoint that you were talking about, the acoustic component that you were talking about is incredibly important to make sure that you get the right dome. Right. If you don't have the right dome, there's a couple of things that happen. Number one, uh, you can have a significant amount of amplification that's needed to meet your prescriptive targets uh, just basically leak out of the ear canal. And so the first thing that happens is that you lose a lot of clarity or volume or both from that happening. And in addition to that, you also can end up with the creation of feedback. And so feedback is really when the uh, sound that has leaked out of the ear is being picked up by the microphone and recycled through the hearing aid in the form of an annoying high pitch squealing whistling squeaking type of sound uh, everyone I think has heard that at some point or another and if you're hearing that consistently out of your hearing aids that means that that something with the acoustics there is not correct. Absolutely. And so there are ways for us to make sure that the physical fit and acoustic fit and retention of the amount of sound, the proper amount of sound inside of your ear canal is appropriate. And we have a graphic for this that we can put up here. This is uh, called a feedback. Oh, we'll show you the domes here first. Let's keep oh, that up perfect. on the screen here really quick. So there are a variety of different styles and types of domes that could be fit on the tip of your receiver and canal hearing aid. Up at, up at the top of the screen, we have the uh, open fit. When you go down one level there in the second row, we have the vented fit, so a little bit more transmission of sound in and out of the ear canal. Then you have the power domes that are kind of like the double domes that trap in everything. And then you have the cap domes at the very bottom for individuals with sensitive ear canals that, that acoustically function very similar to the, uh, the open domes on the yeah. very top of the screen. But you can't just randomly pick one of these. You have to pick the most appropriate physically fitting one and the most appropriately uh, acoustically fit one. And so let's go to the feedback curve here. And we can see this is actually a really good example of a feedback curve with a particular earpiece. And I would guess in this particular case, we had a custom ear mold that is not allowing a ton of leakage of sound, which is a good thing. So as long as that purple curve is hugging up against that gray range at the top of the screen and it's not cutting down into the red curve there, that means that we are not at risk for feedback. So I would say from an acoustic perspective, if we uh, put a dome or a ear mold on someone's ear or on their hearing aid inside of their ear and we did this feedback measure and we saw this, we would say, hey, we are A-OK -okay to move on to doing real ear measurement with this individual. Right. Now, this also this doesn't normally end up this pretty, right? Uh, sometimes we end up with having a significant amount of feedback risk detected by the software and so then we end up with a, a uh, an image where the purple curve that you see on the screen is really starting to run into those red and blue lines and the red and blue lines are signifying how much amplification is coming out of the hearing aid at that specific frequency range that's needed to overcome the hearing loss however if it creates that level of amplification what's going to happen is it's going to fall out of the ear and get picked up by the microphones so the hearing aid will actually limit its output to not go above that threshold but 
if above that threshold is where you need it to be to hear, then you're sacrificing clarity. So the acoustic coupling here is just super important. Yeah, I mean, you can't just fit someone with an open fit dome, have a bunch of leakage and reduce the amplification so you don't get whistling because you don't right. actually hear better. But until you run that measurement, you don't know if that acoustic coupling, if that dome or that ear mold vent size is appropriate for that individual. And again, if you do not get a proper fit here, you can't go and say, okay, we're good. Like, let's continue on with real ear measurements. Uh, you're gonna, if you do, that's fine, but you have to come back next, the next visit uh, with either a custom mold to fit on that individual or a different type of dome right. to fit on that individual. Right. Now we do have some good news. We think that we got Dr. Sarah Curtis back on. So let's bring her back up on the screen. We'll all cross our fingers collectively together. Uh, we'll blame <laughs> this on the hurricane that's down in Florida, but she's up in Ohio. So yeah. I don't know if we can do that. I think we can still blame it. <laughs> Hey, Sarah, can you how are me you? Okay? I can. Yep. I'm good. All right, great. <laughs> Yay, perfect. Sorry about perfect. all that. No, no, we're sorry. Thank yeah. you so much for joining us. We're so happy to have you here. So my original question that I was going to lead in with you was, we're talking about test box measures. We're talking about quality control. Yeah. Can you speak to some of the quality control outcomes that you see in your clinic in terms of you know, new devices passing or failing and, and return from repair devices as well. Yeah, so I, I wanted to point out though, our patient care coordinator, if you call, knows exactly what electric okay, acoustic good. measurements are. So. Nice, <laughs> that's awesome. We have a small practice and, you know, we all pitch in everywhere. And so um, I'm fortunate I take student externs. And so my student externs, it's been a wonderful learning opportunity for them and they run, um, the electroacoustic analysis on every hearing aid that comes into our practice, the test box measurements. Awesome. Um, we see most commonly that directional microphones are flipped, um, <laughs> which is a big problem. And if you don't know that it's there and somebody comes in and they've been fit and they say, oh, my hearing aid isn't helping me at all and background noise and um, I just feel like I was promised all these wonderful things and I'm doing lousy. and when all in reality, when the hearing aids are supposed to be for focusing forward, they're focusing behind you, that's going to result in horrible audibility and background noise. So <laughs> it's really nice to know that on the front end. And we've had hearing aids that we have caught that initially and sent it back into the manufacturer before the patient was ever fit. Um, that's a huge example of uh, why it's important to do it um, and why we do it on every fitting. and. Full disclosure, we see patients that have all different types of pay options. We see self-pay, we see Medicaid, we see a bunch of different ones, and it is a procedure that we never cut. It is always high value to us because if we have someone walking around in hearing aids that don't work, there's no pur purpose in them wearing them. Absolutely. And I tell that to people all the time is that um, hearing care providers will cut corners on things. And when they start to identify like, oh, like the patient never actually physically sees me do these test box measures. So I do, I really have to do them. And then they kind of rely on the, oh, well, if, if they have issues, they'll come back and let me know. And then we'll just send them into repair. But you know, the whole purpose of doing this is so our patients aren't the ones who are having to try to figure out what the heck is going wrong with their devices, right? Right. I will say one of the other things that we pride ourselves in is, you know, not everybody needs new hearing aids every three years. We've had people that have come in that we adopt from other places. Our protocol is you come in, you get a full test. We take your hearing aids. We clean them up really good. We have a redux. I've, have you talked about redux on your show? Because it's a miracle worker. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's even better um, where so you're at up in the Midwest. Out here in Arizona, we don't have as many moisture oh, issues, yeah. but absolutely. Oh. Yeah, so we run them through a deep cleaning, a redux, and then we do EAA before we do anything else. Um, and if the hearing aids don't meet specs, um, if it's a receiver in the canal hearing aid, it's great. We swap the receiver, and I would say about 50% of the time, the distortion's gone and the hearing aid works perfectly. And But we won't program a pair of hearing aids unless it passes EAA if it comes into our program. And that is just a fit set cost. Our patient care coordinator knows how to answer that question. If a call comes through, they will say, these are the procedures that will be done. Um, but also I will I will tell people, I have been doing real ear measures since the day I went into graduate school. I have never fit a hearing aid without them. 
Um, when I walked into my first job and we didn't have enough verification equipment for everybody, I said, well, buy me another one. And they did <laughs> because it's just not okay to fit without it. Um, I, I'm pretty um, outspoken, but the it's just that important. And one of the things I've realized, and Cliff, I don't know how many ear molds you guys fit in your practice, but there's a certain point in a hearing loss that if it domes just do not cut it. Mm -hmm. And I see those patients walk in my practice all the time. We test them and we look at their audiogram and we say, I'm sorry that your old practitioner decided you didn't need ear molds, but I will not refit you. You will not pay me for real ear measures until we get an ear mold on those hearing aids because it's not even worth your time. For sure. Um, yeah, it's, it's literally, you're ta you would be taking their money to do the refitting and without providing them with a better outcome. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you ask any uh, you know, ethical provider, that is what an ethical provider would do is that they would say, I'm sorry, I'm just not going to try to reprogram these knowing you're going to have the same exact outcome because we didn't fit you following best practices with using a custom ear mold at that point. Yeah, it's, you know, we just focus, we focus so much on the right fit. I had a patient I fit today. I, I do testing for veterans and this poor guy was like, I should have been hearing better five years ago. I'm not even going to wait for them to decision me. I'm just buying hearing aids from you. So I said, all right, go ahead. Awesome. He came in. Um, and we fit him with a pair of hearing aids that I love, but I did research a couple years ago. I don't know if you knew that, but I did this in-house research where I ran every single manufacturer in my test box to the same four hearing losses. And I looked at what do they predict the output should be for these hearing aids to fit them properly. And every single one of them was significantly under. Nobody, nobody was up to target. Nobody gave appropriate audibility. And so, and it's, that was, it's a wonderful thing that I teach my students, but in this case, this, this gentleman, um, I had to go up about 10 decibels overall from what the manufacturer set him to, to meet his targets. We knew when we first programmed him, he's a dome candidate, but the dome that was recommended by the manufacturer didn't give him the appropriate gain in the middle frequencies. We switched the dome right away. We got amazing matches to NAL and L1 targets. And he had tears in his eyes by the time he left because he said, this is like when I got my cataracts removed and all of a sudden the whole world was clearer. Um, and I never could have achieved that if I didn't do all the things we did, if we didn't do the EAA on the front end. But I also counseled him, this is going to be loud and annoying and you are welcome to curse me under your breath or fully out <laughs> loud when you go home but i am not doing my job if i don't if i make you comfortable rehabilitation means you're uncomfortable on day one you may be uncomfortable after week two but six months from now you're going to call me crying for a loner if your hearing aid breaks for five minutes so <laughs> yep, and absolutely. that's that's the goal you know well, you it's know not, i think I think, you know, and, and you're, you're explaining all this perfectly and, and you're exactly the reason why uh, we wanted you inside of the Hearing Up Network. So can you explain a little bit about why you felt it was important to join the network yourself? Yeah, so, so I saw, when you started it, I went, well, gosh darn it, I already do all that stuff. So um, I'm going to sign up because I don't want anybody else uh, getting in on my space here <laughs> when they should be coming to me because I knew to do it in the first place. But no, I mean, it holds us to a high standard and we get really curious patients that come to us through the Hearing Up Network, a lot of really good research. It makes me a better audiologist because they know a whole lot of stuff from you. They'll say, well, I watched 13 of his videos. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, okay, I got it. Cool. Um, and we do a lot of teaching and a lot of, you know, but it's, it's just been rewarding. I get a lot out of being in the network. I get, um, I tell everybody, I get some of my best referrals through you guys. And it's, it's been really nice to be recognized for the high quality work that we do. And for people to come to us, we get people that come an hour and a half away to our practice because of the work that we do. Yeah, and that's that's not abnormal. When you find a provider who follows best practices, they're worth driving substantial distances to because, I mean, even if you spend five hours a year making sure that your hearing care is done the right way, literally every other minute of your life is 
dependent on that from a hearing perspective. So I uh, just want you to know we appreciate you greatly. You've been in the network pretty much since the day that we started it. So. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. We really, really do appreciate it. Thanks. You guys take care. Stay All right, warm thanks, out Sarah. there. Yeah, <laughs> bye-bye. Okay, bye. All right. Dr. She Sarah Curtis, I'll tell you. Awesome. A champion of best practices in our profession. And I know that we um, – uh, we spend a lot of time um, talking about best practices on this show and about how a lot of providers don't do them and things like that. There was a lot of providers who have been providing best practice care for, um, for years before I got online and started talking about it. And she is one of those individuals. Um, and that is the important thing that you don't have to be a Hearing Up Network member to follow best practices. You, if you don't have a Hearing Up Network member in your area, the thing that you need to do is you need to take your own care into your own hands, print off the best practice checklist that you can find on hearingup.com and take them with you to that provider and demand that they follow best practices. Right. Um, and they have to have the right equipment to do it. It's just the fact of the matter. If they do not have a test box, they have no way to follow best practices. So those are questions that you need to ask. Um, but uh, we, are, we have spent a lot of time talking about several very important aspects today. And I do not want to shortchange real or measurement. So we are probably going to turn this into a four-part series uh, of this uh, because you just can't compress best practices. And we really want to talk about real or measurement. I know I lied to you earlier saying that we'd get to it today. I promise you we're going to spend an entire episode on best practices next week. So um, with that being said, uh, we're about to jump into the Q&A section. We have Kelsey back here. Kelsey is the one who now has her voice back and, and me and Dr. Cook are the ones fighting through right. our uh, lack of voice. I am so sorry, you guys. I feel wholly responsible for it. So And we blame you entirely. Out there, to everybody out there, you can absolutely blame me. I will take the fall for it this time. <laughs> All right, so we have had some great engagement online throughout this entire episode. Um, we got pretty technical today, uh, which we yeah. normally don't do and we try to stay, stay away from, so we have some clarifying questions to go through here as well today. Uh, the first is, uh, so is this quality check a verification of whether the hearing aid is operating within tolerances or portions are non-functional? Uh, and what quality assurance does the hearing aid manufacturer perform before they send it to us? So interestingly enough, when we receive the hearing aids from the manufacturer, uh, they come with a printout of these test box measures completed. And I think that that is potentially what leads to such a low rate of providers actually doing these measures because you get a, you know, a receipt of these measures being done in the packing and you think, okay, it's already been verified. But the problem is, is that even in transit, we can see that these devices uh, go out of specifications, whether they were just jostled around too much or they got too hot or, you know, maybe they weren't tested when they left the manufacturer. I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can probably blame FedEx and UPS <laughs> a lot for the issues that you see with these test box measures. But um, it just makes it uh, all the more reason that you have to test it because you just can't trust what has happened from the time it left the manufacturer manufacturer to the time it got to us. Um, they do these measures. I think that possibly during COVID, maybe they got a little lackadaisical at the manufacturers. I don't know, but I feel like, and if you ask other providers, I think we all feel the same way that the, the rate of devices not meeting specifications increased substantially due to uh, following COVID. or during and following COVID. Yeah. And I have to think that the only other variable that has potentially changed is on the manufacturer side, maybe things are slipping through the cracks a little bit. Right, and uh, in that question as well, there was a question about are they um, tolerances? Right. Yeah, so uh, this is a quality check or verification of whether the hearing aid is operating within tolerance or if portions are non-functional. Um, I guess kind of, of a, both. A, a combination yeah. of mm -hmm. the two, yeah. Uh, not necessarily personal tolerances, but um, whether they are operating within the designated specifications for that device. So yeah. this is going to have nothing to do with you. This is going to have nothing to do with your hearing loss. This is going to have everything to do with is the device doing what the device says it can do. Yeah. So when you think about tolerance in this particular case, we would say a plus or minus. Mm -hmm. So when you see an, an output uh, a OSPL 90 max, so when you put a 90 decibel signal through the hearing aid, what is the max output that you would get 
in that one example we had, it was like 130, 131. Well, it doesn't have to hit 131 exactly. It has a range that it can fall within. And if it mm -hmm. falls within that range, we're like, we're good. And so ANSI, so the American National Standards Institute, um, they have all of these specifications that they have to fall within. And so we actually have a binder that has all of the tolerance ranges. We would do a printout of the manufacturer specifications for that device. And we would look, OK, what did we get? OK, what do we need to get? Did it fall within the tolerance range? And if it did, for all of those different measures that we talked about, then the hearing aid's good. If any one of those falls with outside of the tolerance range of what we measured, then that hearing aid needs to go back. I think it's also important to remember, too, that this is not, you know, you as the, you know, consumer of these hearing aids. It's not your job to identify, you know, maybe this is not sounding quite right. You know, the reason we do it so proactively is because there are times where you're not going to notice um, or it's going to have happened so slowly uh, that it's not a stark contrast from what you should be hearing versus what you're hearing now. And so it's our job to stay on top of that to make sure you're getting the benefit from your device. Um, right. And I think that that's a very important distinction because oftentimes, you know, you know, my distortion is really high. Well, you, it, it might not sound that way to you yeah. because it happens so slowly. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's, that's always important. the most fun thing that happens is that they're like, oh, here, everything's going fine. Mm -hmm. And then you come back and you're like, so did you realize your distortion was at 15%? They're like, no idea. And then you, and you put, put them back in their ears. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, that sounds way better. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So that's always um, fun on our part. But, you know, it's, it's again, something that you may not notice. Um, the next question is, how frequently are the audiologists' inspection instruments themselves calibrated? Because we need to make sure that if oh. we're going to run the measures, our equipment is also calibrated. And oh, yeah, OK, I, I see the question yes. now. Yes, yeah. yearly. Yeah, annual, annual calibrations mm -hmm. is what you should be having done with all the equipment um, anytime it falls outside of that. And, oh, and I should add this, is that on a monthly basis, the equipment prompts you to do a, a room calibration or self-calibration of the equipment. So you're having the professionals come in with all their equipment. you got to shut down the clinic for a half a day mm -hmm. so they can test all of the equipment. Because when you think of all the stuff we need calibrated, it's probably a good 12 to 15 pieces of equipment yeah. inside of the office at this point. Maybe not quite that high. but. Um, but they do their professional calibration, give it the stamp of approval, and then every month we have to run calibrations to make sure like the reference microphones are functioning the right way. We do all this stuff with realer measurements as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've worked at clinics who do a lot of the calibrations even weekly for some of their devices as yep. well. And so, you know, it is something that clinics who do these measures are staying on top of. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, the next question is, can I ask my provider to do these tests? My daughter has had nothing but problems since her ear molds came back from repair. Mm. Oh, well, definitely, 100% yes. Um, and, and here's the thing, maybe they did. So mm -hmm. ask to see if they have the test box measures that they can pull up for you. Um, being the pessimist that I am when it comes to test box, I just don't believe that most providers are doing this. So there's yeah. a solid chance that they don't even have a test box inside of the clinic. Yeah, then they probably have the printout from the manufacturer saying that the device is meeting specifications. But I can tell you, um, just even over the last few weeks from hearing aid fittings that I was not able to proceed with or uh, a hearing aid returning from repair that I was not able to fit on the patient because I had to call them and say, you know what, your device came in. We ran a full diagnostic check on the device. And unfortunately, it is outside of specifications. The, de you know, the device sheet that they sent with the mm -hmm. hearing aid was within specifications, but when we ran it in clinic and our audiology assistant will sometimes run these two, three, four, five times to, to really make sure yeah. like, is this actually out of specs? Um, and then we've got to send it back from that point. So unfortunately, I hate to be the, bad, the bearer of bad news when I'm like, oh, I can't get you fit with this device. But overall, it is 100% for the benefit of the patient to not go home with a device that was never actually fully repaired. And in this case, that may be what's happening. And you brought up an interesting point. I've seen it to where patients ask for something to see something, and the provider shows them something completely different, saying that it's the thing that they're asking for. Uh, so it is very important to actually know and educate yourself enough to identify what is a test box measure versus, uh, you know, a feedback measure, right? right? So like if you go in and ask, can I see the test box measure? Like, oh, yeah, they pull it up in the software and you see a feedback measure. That is not a test box measure. That is a feedback measure. And I've seen this happen with Realer when they say, oh, can I see my Realer measurement? And they go, oh, yeah, here's the Realer with, that we did. And it's the feedback management, which is not Realer. Not mm -hmm. So you really have to make sure that you're educated about this stuff. That is a fantastic question. It I is. definitely 
uh, believe that you should go in and ask to see that. And if they can't produce it, then you have no idea if it's a programming issue or if it's the mechanics of the actual earpieces. Absolutely. Most definitely. Uh, our next question is, in what circumstances during a follow-up appointment would an audiologist decide that a diagnostic on the hearing aids is appropriate? Well, at our clinic, uh, so we do have, um, like we referenced earlier, we do annual checks of the devices. And so um, each of our patients who comes back for their annual visit comes in. Uh, at that visit, we're doing a comprehensive audiological evaluation, and we're also doing the full hearing instrument test measures. Um, and very often, like you said, patients will say everything's great, going wonderfully, you know, and we, we don't anticipate running into test box measures revealing what they do. Then we run test box measures and we're like, ooh, 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 no, no, no. This is not working the way that it should. And like you said earlier, we fix it and then they're like, ah, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize that it didn't sound right. Absolutely. And, and sometimes we run it, you know, in January and then they come back in for a follow up in March and they're like, yeah, something's just not right. And we run it and it's like, oh, well, now you are out of specification. So we have to get it fixed. So um, the thing is, is that sometimes it's predictable that you're mm -hmm. going to find something with it. And other times it's completely unpredictable that you're going to find something. And that's why uh, our belief is, is that if it comes in initially from the manufacturer before we fit a new hearing aid on a patient, we run it. If a hearing aid had to go into the manufacturer for repair and it comes back to us before we fit the patient with it again, we run it. We run it on an annual ba basis. We have a platinum visit where we do comprehensive testing on everything and we run it then even if there's no complaint of it. And then the other time that we would run it is if there is complaint of something going wrong and we need to run it through the test box to find out what that is. So right. yeah, I think very often I'll have patients too who I see for follow-up after follow-up after follow-up, things are going good, 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 and then not good and we didn't make any programming changes. We didn't change any of, we didn't make adjustments to anything. Mm -hmm. And so that instantly makes me think, hmm, is it your hearing or is it the hearing aid? And then asking those follow-up questions. Um, and then, you know, it's, it takes just a few minutes to take the devices to the back and actually run those tests. But I think they're extremely valuable in helping to determine what's actually going on here. Is it you or is it the device? Yeah. So. yeah, I mean, we are talking best practice audiologic care here. You know, providers who do not follow best practices, they don't do this stuff. They don't care about it, to yeah. be quite honest with you. And I, again, I sound like a pessimist when I talk about test box measures, but I just know that not a lot of people are doing it. And it's unfortunate because there are literally thousands of people that are walking, or probably tens of thousands of people that are walking around right now with hearing aids in their ears, thinking that they're hearing their best or struggling with their hearing. And it's because they did not have test box measures run on their devices because their providers are not following comprehensive best practices. But uh, guys, that is all the time that we have for today's show. We ran over today as well, and we didn't even get into real <laughs> measurements. So uh, kind of a, a crazy episode, but obviously you can see how important test box measures are. We really needed to make sure that we hit on this. Kelsey, thank Thank you for coming in and asking us questions. My pleasure. Uh, if you guys are, are happy that Dr. Cook was able to actually proceed with today's, uh, today's uh, podcast, um, give us a thumbs up because her voice has been rough for the beginning half of this week. But yes. if you guys want to catch us every week, make sure that you find us on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, and WTSM TV. We are at 4 p.m. Arizona time, so your time zone has changed and ours haven't. And as always, we'll see you next week.